let me welcome you to the second of our Dacha webinar series. My name's Liz Jones. I'm policy director at the National Care Forum um, and have had the privilege, actually, of being involved with this project from pretty early on. So the Dacha study uh, is, is, is a four, five, four year, five year endeavor. Five, I think. Four. Four. Uh, endeavor to um, help us to work out what a minimum data set for care homes looks like, focused especially on the needs and preferences of people living there, working there. So we, we've got a series of uh, three to four webinars bringing to our audience uh, a series of presentations to help you understand what we have found in our various work packages. Uh, and this is the second webinar, which is focused really on what enables people working in, in care homes, what enables them to use resident data for the care that they deliver. We're particularly focused on how to translate the theory into the practice and bring change, bring that change about uh, the potential and the use of a minimum set of data uh, into a care setting. How do we support staff to use that to understand what a minimum data set might be and what it can do for them? the people they support and um, and also how it can make their life a little easier in terms of all of the various uh, demands, data demands, because we know that there are a lot of duplicate demands um, across the system. So we've got a, a series of presentations for you. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of webinar etiquette to keep us on the straight and narrow. Um, before we embark on our first presentation from Professor Clare. So we are recording this and we will be sharing the recording and the slides. Uh, so they'll go to everybody who signed up. Uh, so our presenters don't get any distractions. Can you please um, keep your microphones off? Um, videos, it's up to you. I quite like to see people's smiling faces, but if you're having your lunch, then fair enough. Um, in terms of listening to our presentations and when we've got an opportunity to take your Q&A, if you could pop your questions in the chat as you're thinking about them, um, we will go through the series of presentations and then we've got about 25 minutes, half an hour to work through uh, all of the questions that are in the chat uh, and uh, ask our various presenters to respond to them. So we've got three presentations today. We're going to hear first from Professor Claire Goodman, um, who's going to present on the realist review of minimum data set use in care homes. Then we're going to hear from Nick Smith, uh, looking at how, telling us about his the research on how care home staff interpret and use quality of life assessment tools and scales, because remember that um, a part of uh, the Dacha study uh, was looking at different quality of life measures uh, and understanding how they worked out, really, <laughs> trying um, a, a range of measures and seeing which ones um, uh, were easier to use, harder to use, resonated more, resonated less. And then we've got Lucy and Rachel talking to us about implementation of a minimum data set. Um, and if you're wondering why, um, as a representative of care and support providers, I'm chairing the session and I've been involved in the whole project, um, it's because I've been um, lucky enough to support the PPIE angle of the, the project, which has, I think, been exemplary in getting different voices um, across the whole of the sector for whom a, a minimum data set will be of real importance. So that's voices of providers, that's voices of people, that's voices of people working in care, and that's voices of um, the families and the care supporters that people have. 
and it's been a fascinating journey to hear the perspective of those different voices as we've worked through the different work streams. And I think it's just, I really want to focus the fact that th this, the, all, of the, all of the effort and the strands, work strands that have gone into this project have been putting the interests and the, um, I guess the views, perceptions and impact and outcomes of the people being supported in care homes and of the people working there. That's been at the heart of the approach from uh, Claire and, and the way that she's led the team. And we've had a lot of insights across the different work streams from our PPI group. It's been hugely valuable. And we've also um, created a, an, a new and innovative way to actually hear from residents themselves, which is often a stumbling block. So. This is kind of with the sector, for the sector, by the sector, and Claire has been pivotal in kind of holding us to account on that. So um, I'm going to hand over to Professor Claire Goodman. Okay, thank you very much. So can everybody see that? Yes. Great. Okay. So thank you, Liz, for the introduction. Thank you to everybody who's coming on a Friday at lunchtime. So just to give you a little bit of context before I start the talk, the Dacha study is just over four years. It happened started before the pandemic when we were the only people interested in data. Now we're running to catch up with all the policy changes. And I think hopefully the discussion um, at the end, and please do put questions, comments, experiences into the chat box. So there are five work packages, all of which are doing different things, but are all feeding into how can we understand how to use residents' information in ways that are useful and usable by as many as possible, but crucially um, support the care of older people in care homes. So that we're looking at um, evidence, we're looking at previous research and reusing that data where we've looked at the information that care homes are already collecting and therefore probably don't need to be asked to collect even more data linkage between data held about residents in NHS and local authority data sets and then the final work package work package five which is saying how can we deliver a minimum data set that is collected in care homes and can be linked with information about the same residents in routine data sets so that you have a complete picture of what is happening. So before I even start, I just need to flag that there isn't really an agreement about what a minimum data set is. Memorably, in a very early conversation, somebody said, well, I think it should be no more than 10 items. Um, actually, it's more than that. But I think if you're wanting to sort of understand how Datra has defined it, I would recommend this paper that we wrote to actually help us agree across the team. But essentially, the key characteristics is it's a standardized account about residents, dem demographics, social and health characteristics and needs um, as they live over a period of time in care homes. It's based on existing evidence of what we know is important to measure, but it crucially also bringing the information that matters to residents and staff, because historically there tends to be more of a medical emphasis on these data sets. Uh, we want it to link to existing data and we want it to be useful to a wide range of people who are interested in the welfare of older people in care homes. So this is from work package three and is saying, OK, we know about minimum data sets. We can, we've seen them being used extensively. We now have a policy. But what do you need to know to be able to implement it in a way that it goes further than it being an administrative exercise and something that is resented as yet another distraction from care. So the background to minimum data sets, they are well established in some countries, particularly in America and Canada, um, Netherlands and Belgium. All of New Zealand has implemented something called the INTERI, which is the International Resident Assessment Instrument, and some states in Australia. Um, they've gone through lots of iterations. They're constantly being approved and adapted to apply to different groups. In the UK, and particularly in England, we don't have a history of minimum data sets. So the Joseph Roundtree 
back, I think in 2006, did try to introduce a minimum data set with its care homes with variable success. And there was the shelter study led by Ian Carpenter that was an EU study that England participated in and had 507 residents as part of a pan-European study. And we're able to clearly show they use the inter version that it was incredibly helpful for clinicians and for understanding care home populations. But when you looked at the qualitative data, there were concerns about staff burden, depersonalization of care and consistency of reporting. And it's been something that's there, but hasn't really had much traction. So this realist review was asking, well, how and why can a minimum data set work or not when it's being used in a care home? What does the evidence tell us about its acceptance and use? And can we develop a theory of what is likely to work, which we can then take into the future um, minimum data set work that we're doing? And can we test and refine the theory based on the information we're doing? So that's the reason why we did this. And I'm going to go straight to findings because I think even this slide is quite telling. So you can see in the top there, two thirds were from America and Canada, the paper of the 51 papers that we looked at with one or two papers from these different countries. But crucially, what you have to remember is these were papers that told us something about implementation. So there are thousands and thousands of research papers that have used minimum data set information. But we were looking at, well, what can you tell us about how it gets implemented, how it gets used in the care home. And we only were able to retrieve, well, it's actually less than 51 because we also looked at bigger implementation research about implementing generally in care homes. Um, and of those 51, very few, that was the reason for doing the study. It was more that there was information in the paper commenting on what had worked well or where they had issues around data completion. So from that work, we developed three theories of what you need to do if you're going to implement a minimum data set. Now that's relevant for Datcher, but now as we have the big policy shift to the minimum operating data set, I think there is already um, translatable findings um, for our current situation. So motivation of staff. Clearly you need your staff to be engaged and it would appear that you'd need a mandate. So it isn't enough to persuade people the value of it, to say this is really helpful, this is really important. There has to be an element of force, is what we called it, that there isn't a choice. You have to collect the minimum data set. And that's quite a controversial finding in the, in the get-go. Um, so in some countries, that was where completing your minimum data set was linked to reimbursement. You didn't get paid if you didn't do it, so with Medicare, um, or was tightly linked to quality assessment and review. But what the evidence also showed very clearly was if you only relied on that, that wasn't going to be enough. And it had to be accompanied by training and ongoing support where staff were able to link the data that they were collecting on the residents with their care planning. Now, that might seem obvious, but it's quite easy to collect, to collect data from a minimum data set and it'd be completely separate from your day-to-day -day care. So for example, if you're recording information on continents, how does that then feed into your review and discussions about whether you know, everybody is suddenly in pads and couldn't we do something different, for example? And also it really worked if it was used as the basis for interactions between care home staff and visiting cl clinicians. So clearly a basis if you're with the regulator, but also that, that this is the starting point for when your GP, your geriatrician, your therapist is, that, that staff could have this as their resource. But what we couldn't find in the implementation literature was how do you do this? How do you provide constant feedback on how staff are doing, how useful it is, and actually telling them um, um, so that they can see that they are making a difference through the data completion. So that was the first one. The second one is clearly linked to that first about frontline staff involvement. But what the evidence shows is that already in long-term care, there are different decisions about who gets to enter the data. And that could have an impact on then how the data is used. So if you put it all in the responsibility of one person, which often happens uh, with the big North American minimum data sets, how does that affect the staff on the floor's ability to be able to use the data? And also, does it risk excluding staff insights, which are key for continuity of care, 
and, and it getting into the minimum data set. So you need it. We suggest from the evidence that you need to have ways of getting the staff actively involved in the data entry in ways that are meaningful. And also you need to encourage your visiting clinicians to be involved in entering data that is relevant. You cannot and should not have parallel systems of information, which we can discuss this clearly already raises various questions. Because what we found in the implementation literature was that this, the outcome would be creating a common language and point of reference. We also found that it was really important from the get go to acknowledge just how time consuming this is and not pretend it will automatically make work easier or quicker. It probably will in the long term. And over 20 years of reviewed research, we were looking at it taking 60 to 90 minutes for a full assessment of a resident on arrival. And then revisiting all those areas regularly was time consuming. So it was really important that that was a valued activity um, and something that was seen as integral to care. And then there was the issue about the rapid move to digitalization. Now, I think we had to look at this one with a little bit of a caveat because there wasn't very much about this. And obviously, um, a lot, of, certainly in this country, we are rapidly moving away from paper records, but we still have hybrid systems. So this one is a little bit more difficult to um, be as affirmative on. But nevertheless, I think we're looking at it as you'll hear from Rachel and Lucy. But it's more about being happy using e-records and digital literacy. Some of the evidence suggests it's about the ability and confidence to put to move around and look at different areas of the notes about a resident um, and their health profile, for example, or their social needs or their quality of life, so that you can begin to navigate and think, oh, well, look, they're not doing so well on that. I wonder if that's related to. So they had staff have the confidence to go and look and see how somebody is doing in another aspect of their life. This was obviously affected by how easily it was to get in to look at the records, whether it was held somewhere else or whether they were on tablets and so on. And again, this recurring message, clinician involvement and interest improved staff data capture and staff referring and using it. So this is if the minimum data set can foster partnership working between visitors and staff, this is a great reinforcement. But as I say, a little bit of a caveat around that, because with the decreasing use of paper records, we really don't quite know how staff are adapting to those very rapid changes. From the evidence, what was unclear was how patterns of reporting and minimum data set change over time. So if you've had one in the care home for a very long time, what happens? Does that mean it becomes routinized or does it just go from strength to strength if you're using the things that we've identified in the review as important? There was research that was pointing to areas of data that was very poorly completed. So that was being picked up by researchers, but nobody was explaining particularly why that would be. Um, and also concerns around how staff interpret residents' needs. And Nick will be talking a little bit about this later. Also interesting questions about how culture and ethnicity affects the recognition and recording of symptoms. So some North American literature was suggesting that key groups were underreported in areas such as pain, um, and particularly this was Afro-Caribbean um, residents. And so I was asking a question, well, what's, what's happening here? And we don't know, um, but there were clearly were gaps and differences. Um, there was also one paper that recognized that palliative care recording dropped off as people were getting closer to end of life. And we don't really know why they suggested maybe it was um, seen as a distraction from the core care, we don't know. And we also don't know to what extent the data you've got in a minimum data set can inform all your teaching. So not just learning and teaching about how do you use a minimum data set, but how do you use your minimum data set to then support staff to learn about different aspects of care by using them, helping them to see about what we know about residents and so on. So our next steps is we are very concerned about making explicit what the minimum data set can and as much cannot achieve for the different stakeholders. There's a lot of high um, promise, well, big promises being made for how this is going to transform the landscape of care. Well, it might, but we have to be really clear about how the implementation will affect that. We also want to go forward now with our strategies to help minimum data set to be the resource we've identified is key to it being useful. 
and demonstrating what is useful and usable feedback for care homes and other stakeholders on a day-to-day -day and on a more um, interim basis. And of course, there is that question at the back, bearing in mind how long it takes to complete these things is keeping the minimum in the minimum data set. It's gonna be more than 10 items, but as soon as these things arrive, then people want to add their information into it. And just as to close and before the summary is the pandemic revealed the invisibility of care home residents. We don't need to argue this case anymore about what happens when you haven't got data. We, it was a brutal experience. Um, and we have nationally, in England, a minimum operating data set being um, rolled out, shared digital social care record, and care home residents becoming part of our data link system with the integrated care systems and their boards. And what we hope is that the DATCHA learning on implementation is already relevant even before we get to our own findings. So just to summarize, what we found from this was you do actually need a mandate. You need just an, an aspect of compulsion to get everybody's attention, but by itself, that will not be enough. And you need to have it cross-disciplinary training and support that gets reinforced, but we don't quite know how to do that in a way that is um, energizing and helpful. But it has to become very quickly the basis for within and cross-care home conversation so that everybody feels they've owned it. It's not somebody taking your data and reinterpreting it for you, which is a real worry. But it's an asset to care for care, not an administrative distraction, because there is a cost to doing and completing uh, a minimum dose set to address what matters to care home staff and upfront acknowledges their contribution. And we need to consider digital literacy and what we need to have to enable that. And this is from the paper that we published. And I just think just to highlight that green that you can put in exactly the same tool, the minimum data set, and it will either create and be the resource for a sense of shared endeavor, or it could exacerbate what are already parallel systems of information exchange, depending on who gets to enter it, interpret it and use it. So thank you. And just these are some of the contact leads of the different people. The slides will be shared. These are all the outputs that you can get from the DATCHA website. There's the address in red. And just to say that these are my views and not those of the Department of Health and Social Care and also reflect what a huge team this is and that none of this could have been achieved without a lot of people involved. But thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. Fascinating. Um, it, it, you, oh. We have to remind ourselves, don't we, that we we were previously in the desert around um, interesting data from social care, particularly care homes, when we started this project. And now we're in the sunlit uplands of um, enthusiasm and interest from many different people. And it has its benefits and it has its disadvantages. Uh, and I think that point about, it, interesting what you say about a mandate. So at the moment, the policy approach from the current government is very much a stick approach um, and I think there is uh, some way to go to create the carrot and stick approach and uh, your summary slide is probably something we should continue to push with the policymakers and the officials uh, because it's that combination of mandate and motivation and benefit that will actually make a difference. And the point around interpretation, I was having a very interesting conversation with one of our members earlier uh, with a new CQC approach to looking at data in, um, in social care systems and some WYSI analysis tools they've got. But of course, you've got to really understand the context of the data that you're looking at. So uh, they had a, a kind of specialist um, reablement service, which is very different to a standard home care service. And if you apply your expectations of one to the other, then your understanding of the data is inevitably limited and quite possibly wrong. So I will lead us on next to our presentation from Nick, who's gonna help us um, explore what we found about that interpretation um, uh, of uh, uh, an aspect of the DATCHA study. So Nick's going to talk to us about how care home staff interpret and use quality of life assessment tools and scales. And just to say, this is <clears throat> of immediate and current 
interest, I think, to the care sector and academics on the call might want to have a think about this because the CQC have just published a whole load of stuff about the way they're going to regulate and assess. And the bit that's blank for the social care sector is all about outcomes. And the reason that's blank is because they didn't find any standardised outcome measures that they thought they could use in social care compared to the ones that they could use in the uh, NHS and the, the health regulation that they use. So we've got an opportunity as a sector to really start to think about how we can create some of those measures. And Nick's insights here will be fascinating um, for us to think about the next stage of uh, getting to some measures that we can potentially all agree on uh, and what we found from talking to staff using them. So over to you, Nick. Thanks, Liz. Um, so I'm talking about um, some findings and the work we're doing on an add-on study to Datcha called a SWAP project. Um, th th this one looks at how care home staff interpret and use quality of life measures. Um, and I'm talking on behalf of a team that also includes uh, Jenny Burton, Stacey Rand and Emery Towers. So very early on in the, the Datcha study, uh, PPIE representatives and stakeholders uh, kind of concluded that any minimum data set must measure quality of life. Um, however, there are some challenges with measuring quality of life um, in care homes. Um, so many care home residents find self-report challenging. If you think about the high levels of older adults who live with dementia in care homes, um, you can start to see how sending out self-report questionnaires uh, across uh, the older adult care home population uh, may result in only a handful of people being completed. Um, so the decision was made that the minimum data set would use proxy measures uh, of quality of life and well-being and that would be completed by care staff. So care staff would complete on behalf of the residents. Um, this of course leads to other issues. So one of those is that the measures of quality of life that exist were often developed as either self-report or for clinician diagnosis so that little was known, little, little is known uh, about how care home staff in, in, care, in older adult care home settings uh, complete the assessments, how they understand and interpret them. So that was kind of the basis for this work. Uh, and the study had two aims. The first one was to uh, explore how care home staff uh, understood and interpreted uh, assessment tools and scales uh, around mental health, quality of life and well-being. And not just any scales, but scales that were part of the uh, MDS and sat within their digital care software. And the second aim was to explore how staff used information from these measures to inform care. This presentation is going to focus very much on the first aim, the how staff understand and interpret uh, the assessment tools, the measures. And so there in the, uh, in the minimum data set, there are three um, different uh, quality of life tools are uh, um, included. I'm just, just gonna run through those quickly. Uh, so the first one is ICAP O. Um, it's a five item, five domain uh, tool designed to measure the quality of life of older adults. Uh, and up on the screen, what you've got is the independence item. And the additional four items are about love and friendship, uh, about thinking about the future, about doing things that make you feel valued uh, and enjoyment and pleasure. And with this item, as you can see, there are four answer options and the member of staff is asked to pick one of those, to tick one box that describes the resident's quality of life at that current time. The next measure was the ASCOT STT4 proxy, uh, a nine item measure um, covering eight domains of quality of life that are considered to be relevant to social care. And up in front of you, you've got the food and drink domain, um, an item. Um, and in addition to that, there are items on personal cleanliness, accommodation and safety, uh, items on occupation, social interaction, control over life and dignity. And like the ice capo, it asks member staff to pick one of four options. However, for in each item, it asks the, the member of staff to do this twice. Once to indicate what they think what their opinion is on the quality of life of the resident. This is often called proxy proxy. And secondly, to, to answer how they think the resident themselves might answer, which is often termed proxy patient. And the final uh, tool within the measure um, was the QualiDem. 
uh, 40 items, uh, which covers a range of behavior, each of, we, each of which is assessed, assessed on a four point scale. And here we've got nine of those items. As you can see, that scale runs never rarely, sometimes frequently. Um, and in a few cases, so does not want to eat, actually it becomes a five point scale by the inclusion of a not applicable option. Unlike ISCAP and ASCOT, where, where scores could be combined into an overall rating of quality of life, uh, QualiDem items, those, those 40 items, feed into nine subscales, uh, which include care relationships, socialization, and feeling at home. So what I'm gonna do now is talk about what we're actually doing. Um, so we're, and how, how are we going about understanding how staff interpret uh, these different tools? So we're doing it via one-to-one -to -one online interviews. Um, and those are with uh, care home staff who have been involved in the collection, collation, or entering of uh, data for the minimum data set. Um, so each of the homes within the Dacha pilot have been invited to take part. Um, the interviews began in, in August, 2023. We're still in the middle of doing those. So if you're a home that's had an invite and you haven't got back to us and you think it sounds interesting, please get back to us and respond to the invite. That'd be really great. And so in those interviews, we, we adopt a, a very specific approach to understanding um, how staff interpret these measures, uh, an approach that's called cognitive inter interviewing for survey design. Uh, and cognitive interviewing techniques are about studying the manner in which targeted audiences, in this case, uh, care home staff, understand, mentally process, and respond to materials presented to them, in this case, a survey, with a special emphasis on potential breakdowns in the process. So what that actually means is we have an interview that's focused on understanding how a person, in this case, the care home staff, understands the question rather than solely on their answer, like you probably would be in most research. Importantly, it's the measures, not the participant, that's the focus of testing. Uh, we're not there to test people's knowledge uh, and, and so forth. And so the way we actually do that in the, in the interviews is we ask the participants, the CAM, the CAM staff, to think about a person that they support or used to support. We ask them not to tell, tell us anything about that person, because as I said, we're interested in how they answer the questions, not the answers they give per se. Then we ask them to look at and answer a quality of life measure or an item from one of the quality of life measures in the data, in the minimum data set. And when I say look at, what we do is we share our screen um, and what they see is something similar to the data entry tools, the data entry software they currently use in the care home. Um, then we ask the person to think aloud when answering the question. And what I mean by that is we ask them to share what they're thinking as they answer the questions. Um, we often give a bit of guidance around this. So we say, you can say anything you like, but if you're struggling to think about what to talk about, talk about what the question means to you, anything you're struggling with, any terms that are difficult, how you're working through the answer options, are there answer options that reflect how you feel, and so forth. It's not really surprising that many people find Think Aloud quite challenging. Um, so sometimes people might answer the question and then kind of retrospectively think aloud and tell you what they thought about when they're answering the questions. But we also use another technique called probing. So we use probes or specific questions to follow up, to explore, to help uncover different aspects of the thought process that haven't come up from the thinking aloud process. And so what I'm sharing here is our analysis framework, and it's a cognitive model of, survey, of the survey response process. In other words, the processes, the activities you might have to go through to answer a survey question. Uh, and importantly, um, we, we've been thinking about adapting the model slightly because we're not just thinking about answering questions. We're thinking in this, in this case about answering questions on behalf of some, someone else. So it adds in a few more layers of complexity, a few more things to think about. Um, but broadly, um, the, the four processes we're talking about are understanding the comprehension of the question, then retrieving the relevant information, be that from memory or from others or from records, um, then the judgment estimation process, well, yeah, what, thinking about what do I answer? What, what, how do I answer this? And then finally, taking your view and mapping that to the responses you might get, you've been presented with. So all of, if you think about all of those items in the minimum data set, they all have a fixed set of answer options and you have to fit the experience and the thoughts you have 
into those answer options. Because we've only done a small amount of interviews so far, we, what I'm not going to do today is present conclusive findings or recommendations, but rather, ex rather examples from our data that kind of illustrate this framework um, and give us or, or make us think um, about what it might say. So the first of these uh, extracts of data is, is around the comprehension of the question and particularly around the meaning of some of the terms. So in this item, in this uh, example, um, which is uh, around the ice cap thinking about the future item, um, the person taking part in the interview would have been asked um, what they thought thinking about the future meant or how they interpreted what it meant to them. And they responded, uh, most of our residents, they're living with dementia. So I sort of think long-term future, as in, you know, next year, is not really relevant to them. I think about the future is the next 10 minutes or the next five minutes for them. It's what they're concerned about. It's what's giving them concern. So you can see that actually in this case, the member of staff was thinking about the future. They were on topic, but actually their interpretation of future is probably quite different to how we would generally think about the term future. And these two quotes are about retrieval of information. Um, and, and the first one um, comes from Ascot Food and Drink Item. So we, we would be asking here, about how they got the information they needed to answer the question. Uh, and they responded, uh, with the residents that are able to have capacity, I did speak with them. I printed off the questions for my activities team to speak with them and asked them for their opinions on the questions. Um, so you can see how here with this, with this ASCOT domain, um, actually where there was capacity, they went and spoke to residents or this, this member of staff went and spoke to residents. Another example of how um, staff retrieved information comes from uh, the Quali Dem has a smile around the mouth item. Um, so it says, I would say I would answer on their behalf because to me, that is something that I'm observing and that I'm witnessing. So you can see that actually other questions were answered in terms of what of, of staff knowledge, staff observations. Now, this is the judgment and estimation process. Um, I've got a couple of couple of uh, examples of data here, and the, and the first is around sense what we call sensitivity, uh, and it's from the Ascot personal cleanliness item, and so I think at the end of the kind of looking at that item, I might have asked the uh, I asked the person taking part, uh, I just want to ask you how easy or difficult you found this question, and they responded, it's a di it, it's difficult for one. I would be honest, it is reflective of the nursing home, it is reflective of the institution. So in other words, that 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 um participant understands or feels that this question reflects not just on the quality of life of the resident but actually on the quality of care the care that, that at home gives which does suggest there's a potential source of bias within this question where care homes might not want to admit to poor care or, or poorer quality of life um, so there might be a small incentive in there to rate quality of life better and then we have another example this time from ice cap uh around the doing things that make you feel valued item um, that talks about, uh, we shared a lot of the questions with the person. Uh, their answers would be completely different to staff. So actually, if we think about perspective, it, it kind of illustrates that even if staff know residents really well, there can be a real difference between what a member of staff thinks uh, about, about someone's quality of life uh, and what a resident themselves thinks. And finally, I'm going to talk about some data around, around response processes. Um, so both of these are about mapping um, your feelings, your experience, your evidence to the supplied answer options. So the first of these is around the QualiDem has tense body language item. And here someone talks about, I, I probably asked about which item they're going to go for, which answer they're going to go for. I will say sometimes or rarely, between sometimes and rarely. So you can see here that the, that the experience and the evidence that this this participant had didn't fit the scale. They wanted a more sensitive scale, a scale that had options between the options, so more than four different options. Um, and another example is also about a quality dem uh, item, the is angry item. Um, and here the person was talking about what they were thinking about when answering a question. Uh, there's other people that are very angry sometimes, and then you would think about answering frequently just because of the level. It's more about how it sort of upsets the environment. If the other person Yet every other day sort of shouts and throws things around and actually walks up to someone and threatens them, I'd say frequently, just because of the intensity difference. And so this is really interesting in that the, all of the quality dem items are based on a frequency scale, uh, sometimes frequently, never always. Um, but here actually, 
they're answering both on frequency, but they're including intensity in their answer as well. Um, so they're on topic, but their answer draws on something else other than the answer options. And so thinking about some of that, some of that, some of that data we've, we've already collected and other bits and pieces we've collected, um, I want to just sort of sum up really some thoughts. So what we're finding so far is that staff are often on topic. Um, these questions are about the things that they do, the support they give um, every day, day in, day out for residents. So, so they, they know this stuff. Um, so it's often on topic, but we have to be careful and think that they and notice that they have specific interpretations of questions and terms. Think about retrieval of relevant information. It seems that the collection methods, um, so how staff go around getting the evidence they need to answer uh, the quality of life items in the minimum data set may be contingent perhaps on resident capacity or on question type. Uh, which both raises issues of comparability between questions, but also suggests that we might need to also think about how residents interpret questions um, because they're sometimes answering them. If we're thinking about the judgment and estimation process, I think we need to also acknowledge that some, some items may reflect quality of care and that may uh, induce some kind of biases into the, into the answers that people give. And also recognize that proxy responses, proxy, well, the answers given on, by members of staff uh, about residents' lives may not always reflect the views of residents themselves. And if we go on to think about the response process, um, I think what we can see is that the answer options don't always map to the answers respondents want to give. They may want to give answers that are slightly different to, uh, and that could sometimes be around wanting to respond on a different dimension to the person who wanted to include frequency in their response. And so what this all kind of leads us to think is that if you're measuring quality of life or setting out quality of life measures into care homes um, and you're basing action or conclusions on this, particularly when you aggregate that data, you need to think very, very carefully about how are the, the people answering those questions, in this case staff, interpreting. So if you want to understand what it means, you have to understand how people have interpreted those questions. So I think that's probably my final conclusion. So here's the... Uh, obligatory uh, disclaimer and my contact details. Thank you, Nick. Fascinating. I've got some questions I'm going to put in the chat now rather than ask you. Just remember. Um, absolutely fascinating. And I think representative of some of the challenges here. Um, when we're talking about trying to get the views of a cohort of people that sometimes it's quite hard to communicate with, however well we know them. That, Interesting, interesting combinations of interpretation. Um, okay, so how we're we doing on time? We're okay. So our next and final presentation um, is coming from Lucy, Lucy Webster and Carol, uh, Rachel Carroll. So Lucy's from Kent and Rachel's from Nottingham and they're talking to us about the implementation of a minimum data set. Uh, well, and as far as we've got so far in this particular work stream. Uh, so over to you, Lucy and Wait. So um, thank you. Um, so myself and Rachel, we're two of a team of five researchers who've been kind of on the ground with this part of the project, as well as part of a, a big team. And um, so we're here today to talk about um, our experiences from uh, working with the care homes, residents, relatives and software providers of digital care records and kind of around uh, the practicalities, challenges, learnings from a proof of concept study of a minimum data set and kind of what we think would be relevant for future implementation. If you move to the next slide, Rachel. Thank you. Um, perfect. So as part of the proof of concept study of a minimum data set, we had four core questions that we were looking to kind of get some answers for um, that we think would be useful for future implementation um, and just, you know, getting proof of concept essentially. So the main thing is, can we actually collect data directly from the care homes in digital social care records? And can we then match that data to information that's already being collected in lots of different sources about residents 
So that's kind of, you know, more health, more NHS data. And in terms of this data, is it good quality? Is it usable? Is it useful? Are there any major gaps? Is there anything that's kind of missing, et cetera? And then with that data, can we do something useful with it? So can it provide better joined up health and social care for residents? And obviously at the moment with the kind of uh, the system changes with integrated care systems, et cetera, um, joining up health and social care is a really big you know, theme at the moment and kind of being able to make use of that data, bringing it together. Um, how can that you know, make care better essentially? And then the big question and kind of, you know, thinking about the future, um, how do we enable a rollout of a minimum data set for care homes in England, which is a very big question. Um, and we will hopefully give some kind of learnings today that might help that. All right. So just to give you a really brief overview of what the uh, proof of concept study is and, and was. So essentially, to develop and test a minimum data set specifically for older adults care homes in England. So uh, led by Professor Anne-Marie Towers, who is on the call, and Professor Adam Gordon. And so the aim was to recruit 60 care homes across three different areas in England. So we've got Surrey, Nottingham, Nottinghamshire, and then the North East and North Cumbria. And we wanted to recruit kind of 970 residents roughly, um, so that we had a large you know, uh, variety of care homes and also lots of residents. And the important thing was that we were, we were working with care homes who were already using digital care record software. And they had to be doing this from one of two software providers, so either person-centered software or Nourish. And so this was important because we were wanting to use data that's already been collected um, in the care homes via these digital social care records. And the idea with this minimum data set is to use as much data that's already been collected as possible. However, you'll have heard from Nick's presentation uh, about quality of life, um, that we did add in quality of life measures as part of this. And that's because from earlier work, it was found that quality of life was one of the main kind of gaps within data that was collected by care homes. And, um, you know, whenever you speak to anyone, they always think quality of life is something that's really important to be measured. So it's really important to include it. So what we did um, is use the data that's already been collected in the digital care record software, so in PCS and Nourish. And we also asked PCS and Nourish, can you put in those additional measures that we want into your software so it can be collected directly by the care home staff for the participating residents? So mainly around quality of life, as I said, but also delirium, cognitive impairment and activities of daily living if this wasn't being collected. And then the idea is that this will be matched and that's currently in the process of, of being matched to routinely collected health and social care data. And so this data sits, as you can imagine, in many different places. Um, so right through from you know, primary care, secondary care, um, as well as CQC data sets. And this bit of the work is being led by the Health Foundation. So they're kind of, you know, more of the experts in terms of data linkage and big data sets. And the idea is that this all fits together because the data are already being collected in the digital care record software by the care homes, those additional measures, and then the health and social care data that sits elsewhere can all be brought together, all be matched into one uh, kind of big data set that will then be the minimum data set. So we uh, did manage to recruit and um, we recruited 975 residents. So we met our target. Uh, we recruited slightly smaller number of care homes, but still, you know, a huge number. So 46 care homes who uh, have all been taking part. And we invited all of their residents who were 65 or older and permanent to take part. And that included both people um, who had the capacity to consent and people who didn't. Okay. Over to me. Thank you, Lucy. So what I wanted to do, first of all, is just talk a little bit about joining this together. So Claire told us a little bit at the beginning about other work packages and what they'd learned from looking at the literature. So Kelly et al. looked at outcome measures and their recommendation was that we standardise measures designed for care homes. So we have done this, as you've heard today, through involving stakeholders and which quality of life measurements characteristics do we think are most important 
then when we matched these to quality of life measures that are already out there, we were able to narrow that down to the five that went into the additional um, measurements. So we did that one. I think we've done OK with that. Peya et al. looked at contextual factors influencing intervention research processes. And they found that team cohesion and people are really key. And they talked about things like um, how if you've got one member of the team that's understanding the processes, they can share this with the rest of the team and get them all on board. So we had a real good working example of this when we'd got the additional measures um, in, put into the software. And as researchers, we can't see this, obviously. Um, so we asked one care home if they would help another care home that weren't able to locate the additional measures within their software. I thought this was super. It's about sharing those experiences and being able to use the practicalities that we were not able to be there to do. Moussa et al was looking at the actual implementation of an MDS through the literature and their recommendation was that the ideal was in person, in real time by IT literate staff and our care homes have been able to do this and I'll talk a bit more about that later. Over to you Lucy. So just thinking about um the lessons we've learned from actually working with our care homes so thinking uh at the start you know managers and management of care homes so uh, we started recruiting our care homes just over a year ago and as you can imagine it's kind of you know the pandemic was easing but there's still a lot of pressures on the sector it was a really uh, you know busy and stressful time for a lot of care homes but luckily we did manage to recruit um you know our 46 care homes and as part of that you know we had to kind of get them on board get them to see the value of a minimum data set um and of kind of you know what their role would be in potentially uh, shaping what you know could be mandatory in some form in the future, which I think is you know what got a lot of our care homes on board was the chance that they are a small number of care homes taking part in the study and they might have some influence you know um, further down the line. But also kind of relating back to um, uh, Nick's presentation on quality of life. Um, the care homes were really happy that um, as part of the study, we wanted them to collect some additional data about residents' quality of life because they could see that this could actually impact their care you know, on the residents. And they just thought, oh, this is a really good idea. This is something we're missing. And the same with delirium for a number of care homes. So they have actually, uh, some of the care homes been using the measures for residents who aren't participating in Dacha, which is really interesting. And I think kind of shows they see the value in, in measuring these things. And so, as I say, managers often did see the value in an MDS. Sometimes they didn't. And so there were some tricky conversations that were maybe needed um, with managers, with regional managers, directors, etc. And so um, one of the things that did happen with a number of care homes is we managed to get them on board, say via uh, their director or someone kind of higher up in the chain. And then they were told they were participating um, whereas a lot of the other care homes, we got them on board kind of bottom up. So we uh, got in touch with the care home manager. They really saw the value in the minimum data set and taking part. And then the engagement really differed um, between the care homes that we were able to get on board via the manager and the care homes who were kind of more kind of told they were going to participate, which I think is just an interesting learning in terms of if something is mandatory in the future, how does that work if care homes maybe don't see the value or don't feel like that, you know, their opinions have been valued there? Okay, Lisa, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the staff members. So how do we engage with um, staff, frontline staff in with an MDS? So we did... Um, as Lucy's already suggested, a lot of the care homes, we went through the manager and the manager often um, took the lead in the study in order to not burden the staff. When we did talk to staff, um, activity coordinators were very useful. 
a lot of staff could relate to what a minimum data set was and the gathering of information through the handheld device that they already use because they're already using this software. Um, and when they came with us to talk to residents and relatives, they heard us talk to them on a, on a regular basis about what the project was all about. There was one care home that I know as well that were talking about this in their staff meeting so that if any residents have got any questions, they were able to answer those. So we were pleased really with the way that this was going. For me, a surprise was that in smaller care homes, you might be involved with the um, the person that's named as admin, but actually they did far more than that. And this might be something that you've come across yourselves. So they are... Um, meeting and greeting, they are completing paperwork, they are meeting with healthcare professionals um, and in involved in care if they need to be. So when we looked at uh, completing the additional measures, these people were really key. They knew how to, which residents would be able to um, be involved in conversations, how to contact relatives in the best way um, and who was going to find it difficult to put this additional information into the software at that time. So it was great to have their support. Um, we definitely needed them to help us. Digital literacy and the confidence of staff using the software. We, we really, it's been varied. I think it's fair to say that a lot of people that use the software use it um, uh, in a minimum way they put their information in there were members of the teams out there that were able to extract different information um, but a care home that has engaged with us said that they didn't have the digital skills and they have managed to do this activity without any issues at all the other thing that's come up in relation to um, the digital side is people's confidence I think um, we found that the Care homes wanted our reassurance that they completed the additional measures okay and that they'd been extracted okay. And we weren't helpful in um, being able to reassure them because we weren't able to see that level of information about their software that was between them and the software companies. So that's something that we're going to note for the future. Recruitment of residents has been really interesting and we've been able to recruit people with and without capacity to the study by using different, um, different ways. Uh, we have started with people that do have capacity in, and decided with the help of the team who that might be. For me, there were a few surprises when uh, an example was where they'd got a, um, a couple that lived in their care home. He was physically um, not very able to communicate verbally and his wife had dementia. And yet they were very engaged when I spoke to them, given the push from the staff to say, go and see what you can what you can find out from them. They were very um, interested in the idea that we would like to link information about people that live in care homes and totally understood the study which was really great to see gave me some confidence in who i spoke to next um, we use different techniques i think it's fair to say in how we explained it depending on who we were speaking to and how interested they were it was clear that there was a lot of trust of residents of the care home manager so if we had the care home manager walk around with us um, residents look to them for guidance and advice about whether this it was okay to participate we used this strategy as well to reassure um, relatives when sending out emails or phone calls to them that the um, care home managers were on board with this study and felt it was good for them to participate. Reassurance around data sharing, you can imagine, can't you, that we were talking to people about we'd like to go into your records and have a look and see what there is. And we'd like to also not only do that, we'd like to match it up with the other information that's available out, out there about you. Um, some people were more concerned about this than others. Um, and we were able to talk through the process, although pseudonymization is a little bit difficult for most of us. Uh, we got there in the end. Some residents, I think Lucy, I don't know if you want to speak to this one, but had a, a good knowledge and a real interest in how their data would be brought together because of their own experiences. 
Yeah, there was definitely, a, you know, a good handful of residents who were really interested in like data, information, um, as well as relatives. And I think it was quite often when they'd had experiences where um, they hadn't realised previously, like that their, say their health information wasn't in one place or wasn't joined up. Um, and they've kind of, you know, experienced maybe some delays in care, et cetera, or been disappointed because their information wasn't joined up. So they could see the value in this, if it could potentially help themselves, future residents or, you know, for relatives, they could really see how it could help um, their loved one. Thank you. And I suppose kind of in a related point is that with, um, the care homes we also did a lot of reassurance around data sharing um, so a lot of our care homes even though we were working with you know they needed to be using the software already some of them were quite new to using digital care record software um, there was a couple of homes where they were uh, in the process of adding each resident to the software type of thing others it was a couple of months others it might have been a couple of years so actually for the majority of care homes, it was still a relatively new thing that they're using these digital systems. And so they needed, you know, a lot of reassurance around uh, data sharing. And we did a lot of work, working between the care homes and the software providers, uh, kind of acting as, you know, a, a link between the two. And so each of our care homes had to, share, had to sign a data sharing agreement with the Health Foundation as they are the organization that's Kind of in charge of keeping all of the data and, and linking it and so this did I think cause some anxiety sometimes as care homes might not have been used to signing these data sharing agreements and kind of used to you know sharing their data in this way and interestingly with uh, both of the software providers um, there is differences in how they collect and store data and also processes around data extraction and one of the things we did kind of notice anecdotally is that we had care homes who were you know, singular care homes, care homes in small chains, and then care homes in bigger chains. And one of the things with the bigger chains is that actually there seems to be a lot more anxiety around data sharing when there's a bigger chain, when there's maybe more of a process of who needs to sign off on certain things. Whereas with smaller chains or kind of the more singular care homes, the manager would just be have to sign the data sharing agreement or the director of, you know, three, four care homes, et cetera. Whereas with bigger care home chains, there was just a lot more of a process. Um, and it seems uh, the smaller chains are actually more risk averse, uh, which is interesting. Up to you, Rachel. Okay. So moving on a little bit, once we've got the care homes recruited, then we've got the residents recruited, and we've got the data sharing agreements into place, and then we asked everybody in the care homes if they would complete the additional measures, and everything else was being extracted from their software in their care homes without any other action for them, apart from a little bit of work that they needed to do so that we could work out which participants, which residents had decided to participate over those that hadn't. Once that work was done um, we were able to extract the data and that is being analyzed as we speak in the meantime what we've done is ask um, a member of each care home that's participating in the study to come to a focus group with us um, so that they can talk about what it was like to recruit and what they learned, what we learned, um, what we can learn from them, and also what it was like to complete the additional measures and how they went about that. So we had five focus groups over two weeks and we had 24 participants take place. We split the five groups roughly into these areas. We had a, one that we invited the large group homes to, one for the smaller homes that were just one individual home. We had one um, for uh, one of the software vendors that was um, smaller in number so that we could look at the intricacies of whether there was difference in the software there and staff that were not managers. And then we had one catch-all last session for anybody that hadn't been able to come to any of the others. So these are really, really early findings, but resident, uh, sorry, participants did tell us that um, they did like the idea of a minimum data set. They liked the idea of not having the repetition and they really like the idea that this might help them in communicating across health and social care. Although there was um, 
definite indication that they thought that this was adventurous. They could see that this is only a small step towards that. Um, they could see that there was a process already in place for how they get um, new residents to consent to going onto the software that's already in place there. And they didn't see any issues with being able to put an MDS in alongside that so that they could explain to residents and relatives at that first point of initial assessment that this is how we work and this is, this is what data is going to be collected through the care home. But it's fair to say that they did have concerns and Claire raised these through the literature earlier Depersonalisation is an example of where um, care home staff were completing the additional measures for everybody that had said that they would participate and they were concerned that they were doing these measures across the board. I guess perhaps a question going forward is to speak to these staff about whether um, when they talk about um, person-centred care, is it at the point of measurement that this is done or perhaps is it later? Is it something that they can think about when the care planning open to discussion? So here I've got uh, quite a long reference um, that we've picked out. I, let me see if I can um, see this in full so that I can read it to you, that's better. So I will read it. I'm not sure how big it is on your screen. We've got two references. The first one said, I spoke to the nurses about how we were going to complete the additional measures. Um, and we said, who feels confident about doing this person? Who feels confident about this one? And we just looked at the, all the measures. There was a bit of discrepancy with understanding what to do with some of the measures, but we sort of got to understand what they were asking. I think I did six, two night nurses did four each, and we sort of went through it. It's the same as doing a water low score. You had to be objective and answer the questions as well as you can. I just, couldn't just take the 20 people we had. So we sort of worked it out together. Alternatively, we had um, a care home manager that we asked the same question, who completed the additional measures? And she said, it was me. Why was it me? Well, I'm the, uh, my clinical lead has been on holiday for two weeks and now he's back, but he's got lots of clinical issues to sort. I don't have a deputy, so I'll have to do it. This reference was in relation to completing the quality of life measures. She said it was really interesting to listen to the residents about what he said about his life because you feel that most of them are sad, but he said, no, we have a lovely life now. So one of the questions, I'm not sure which one it is, was very interesting for me when I saw it. I said, oh, that's nice to know. They're happy about their life, even here. This care home manager um, who has a small number of people participating in the study, but she has already decided to roll this out to all of her residents and all of her team are completing all of these measures on a regular basis. Over to you, Lucy. Um, and apologies, I did mean that smaller chains are less risk averse. Um, uh, sorry, today is my last working day on the DACTA project, so I'm therefore using this and the kind of, uh, as you can imagine, last minute panics when you're finishing a job as to why uh, my brain no longer works. So apologies. So um, just kind of bringing together um, what we have learned about information governance and what the implications are, uh, potential implications are for implementing an MDS in the future. So one thing we learned quite early on is that um, the care homes are the data controllers of their data. So these digital social care records, the information they're collecting, the care homes are in control of that data and you know what can happen with it. And the software providers who provide the systems for the data to be you know, collected on and stored on, they're what we call data processors. So in terms of you know, a future minimum data set, how will this work? Who will technically be the data controllers of this data set? Um, and just kind of you know, what will be the practicalities of that going forward? And then um, one of the interesting things, as I mentioned earlier, is that um, the software providers, there's different processes um, in terms of how they manage data, how they extract it, et cetera. Um, and that is interesting. So at the moment, there's 20 software providers who are on the assured list 
from NHS England. Um, so the assured list of digital social care record providers. So if you can imagine that it is quite um, difficult to combine data from two software providers, if you can imagine doing that with 20 software providers, that's, that's going to be a lot of work. And then also within uh, the care home providers as well. Um, so, you know, there's lots of differences um, in how they work in terms of data sharing, et cetera. So there's just lots of different, I suppose, issues, potential barriers at every level of the care home, the care home providers and the software providers that might really impact future implementation. And then just kind of bringing together, you know, what are the emerging findings from us, you know, trying out a proof of concept of this prototype minimum data set. So we do think it's feasible. We have managed to extract uh, data um, from the care homes using their digital social care records. And that is in the process of being linked to that health and social care routinely collected data. The main problem is that data is not standardized currently. So within the two software providers, data is measured and coded differently. And so again, that relates to the point if, you know, if there's 20 software providers potentially, how is this going to work going forward? Um, will there be a standardized way that data will be measured and coded within the systems? And then uh, kind of, you know, uh, from the focus groups that staff do complete these additional measures um, and that they see the value in um, the minimum data set, they see the value in the measures, et cetera, and that there really is a huge potential for this minimum data set to reduce data burden and data collection in care homes. So what's next? So we have asked care homes if they will start to complete the additional measures for anybody that's participating during the month of excuse me, October, ready for data extraction in November. Um, we're going to collate the data on the completeness and measurement characteristics of the data items and then short, share these, sorry, with sh short reports and aggregated data with care homes with the ICSs, the integrated care systems, and with stakeholders. Then we're going to have more focus groups and interviews. With the care homes, we're going to ask for the manager if these reports show that this is useful or not useful and in what way. And then we're going to go and do interviews with the integrated care system representatives to ask them the same sorts of questions. And then these will go out to other stakeholders. And based on this, we should be able to make recommendations about a future implementation of an MDS. So. Thank you for listening to us. Here's a picture of the team and our email addresses. We also have the disclaimer there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm excited. I'm excited for the next steps. Haven't you found some fascinating things? Um, and just on um, the topic of it being Lucy's last day, um, I think everybody at the uh, across the Dutch team would just like to oh give their thanks and huge appreciation for the enormous amount of work that Lucy's been doing with Rachel and the rest of the gang. Absolutely, bit of a bit of an all round um, clap, please. Um, and I'm very impressed that you're doing a, this webinar on your last day as well, and that you're not having a total meltdown. So um, pretty 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 good going there. OK, so I am going to have a look at what we've got in the chat uh, because we've had some interesting questions uh, from um, a number of people. So if you're still on, um, I'm going to ask you to come on screen and um, say a bit more about your questions. So Andy, Andy Aston, are you somewhere? Good afternoon. Oh, yeah, there you are. You're right in the middle. Excellent. Uh, go ahead, please. I don't think I'm not really questions, is it? Um, what, what, which, what would you like me to, to refer to? Sorry. Well, your point was that um, professionals, I presume you mean as in professional researchers, um, are not sharing back our findings and our understanding okay. with the people who actually really matter 
so uh, either the people working that we're working with or the people support the people that we're working with who they are supporting this i assume what you meant yeah um i'm watching my wording because as professionals i don't want to um put anyone down but uh, uh, of course we, we we obviously um we you know disseminate our findings in research papers and things like that but i think it needs to be a little bit more of a personal touch so maybe like people in my role i, I work for enrich so we you know, obviously we get the care homes on board in the first place and then i, I don't think we give them you know that the feedback in in the right way if, if you like after, you know after they participate and things like that and i think in turn that would help care homes to continue that you know participation in things like this and i'm just obviously trying to find some like-minded people who, who can have that discussion with really how can we do this a little bit better mm, yeah well i think throughout this whole project we've had quite a lot of those discussions um and i think particularly rachel and lucy have been kind of at the vanguard of honoring some of that um feedback and well well creating a bit of a feedback loop really so that we have a a, a conversation that's gone round and round um, so that we have been able to adjust some of the things that we've done directly in response to what our participants have said. Um, I think Rachel, <laughs> Rachel's probably got some of the scars of that uh, as, well as, the, uh, as well as the medals. So I don't know, Rachel and Lucy, given that um, you've been at the sort of vanguard of some of that kind of feeding back and keeping that communication loop going, is there anything you would observe about either things we've done differently at this time around in this particular study uh, or things that you think would be of real benefit for the future? I'm not sure if I've got anything else to add, Liz, to what you said. I think I personally also think it's really important, Andy, um, and engaging with care homes and residents and staff and relatives has been the top of the list for the whole team I'm sure um, and going out and visiting and meeting people and being available has, has has been important it's sometimes I appreciate that care homes are busy places they have other priorities we're very pleased that they are participating in research in the first place so I can offer and go and talk to them it's about timing and um, uh, the the way that it's um, structured so that it's useful but not taking a look, uh, up a lot of time um, as Liz says we have all been um, back to the PPI groups and that has changed the way that we've done things I'm not sure if there's anything else to add Lucy no okay so we've got some quality of life questions um, I asked a few let's go to Sarah's first so Sarah asked there's Sarah Sarah asked about quality yeah. of life questions go yeah. ahead Sarah apologies I couldn't quite I couldn't I didn't quite get whether um staff were asking the questions to the patients or perhaps their um their sort of nearest relative if they weren't able to respond or whether staff were sort of saying oh I think this is what the patient might say to this question okay. Yeah, go on, Rachel. Can I answer that one? Sarah, thank you. We had um, some discussions, me and um, Adam, who's my line manager, about what do we advise people when they're doing these additional measures? And Adam was very much of the opinion that, you know, we're, we're not going to advise, go out, let them do what they want to, how often, in what format. And I think that the early findings of the focus group has been that they've all done it slightly differently. Some of that has been, I can see Nick nodding, some of that has been dependent on the resident, some of that has been... Um, um, dependent on the time and the resource of staff in order to be able to fill them out in how much they can engage with um, relatives and other people. Some of our feedback has been that they have um, looked through the notes when the resident hasn't been able to answer. Um, they've also gone to the kitchen staff and asked them what they think about what somebody said or would say, um, activity coordinator, and they've kind of had this team approach. So everybody's done it very slightly differently. Um, I was going to also add in, so we, we've been exploring this a little bit in uh, the, the cognitive interviews. Um, and I think there is that, 
um, sense in which where, where residents have capacity, sometimes they're being asked questions directly. We've got no evidence uh, in, from the cognitive interviews of family members being involved directly uh, or being asked directly. Um, they might actually feed into what's, what, what um, CAHAM staff know more generally and use to answer questions. And I think the other kind of variable that influences how staff gather the evidence is the type of question. Um, so if you look at the different quality of life questions, they're worded slightly differently. So some encourage uh, an observational approach to go and look at what happens or to draw on what you know from what you've seen, whereas other questions um, are more about perspective or how someone feels. So Quali Dem very much asks about behaviours, what behaviours does, does, does the resident engage in? So it encourages uh, an observational approach, whereas ICECAP and ASCOT ask very much about the perspective of the resident and how they feel about an aspect of their life. So it in encourage where possible um, people to go and speak to a resident, but obviously with the, the, the issue of capacity may come into that as well. And, and the other things that Rachel mentioned. And, and, and do you know, what's happened where so if you looked at the data would you know if if that been from a patient or from or a resident or from the carer or from a staff what the staff member thought was happening is that possible or not do you, do you know how how it's been filled in or you as, when you as, when you see the data as far as i'm aware and i have not seen the data that's come back that is not collected um so um staff are asked to fill in the items so with the quality of life you've got the items but there's no there's no mechanism within the software to indicate um how they collected that data whether it was from speaking to someone directly or a family member or records or direct observation that morning or, or whatever so there's nothing within the the software packages that contain the items that does that so this this comes from the the, the kind of work that i'm doing and the work that uh, rachel lucy and her their colleagues are doing when talking about how they gathered that material that evidence thank you can i just ask a question i don't know if we know the answer to this yet have we got any early insights into which quality of life measures the folks in the care homes preferred or is that our next steps we um uh, Sinead and I have started to look well kind of gather and code who made comments about which measure um but that's as far as we've got Liz okay thank you we will uh, know from the um the testing, the analysis, the quantitative analysis, how well the measures are completed, though, and that will tell us quite a lot. So when we do the psychometrics, we will be able to see which measures were more reliable, which measures seem to be more sensitive, which had lots of missing data, for example, because that would be a good indicator that people are struggling to answer some of those questions. So we will get a better understanding of that by the end of the study. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so... S. Taylor asks, I don't know if they're still on, uh, have you been linking with the shared care slash connecting care records programme? I feel like we've tried to connect with everybody um, uh, with a view to that giving care home site of wider data. Uh, S. S. Taylor, you've probably got a Hello. first name. Yeah, there you are. Sandra. Hi. Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Um, so I think we've, I mean, probably Claire and Anne-Marie have been um, at the front end of trying to connect with lots of different um, mm. bits of programmes across government. But um, Sandra, what... can you just flesh it out a bit, the question, just to make sure we're talking about the same thing? Yeah, of course. So there's a, there's a national programme going on of setting up shared care records within local right. areas, which will then be joined up across the country. And there's a sort of a two-way story here, isn't there, where Number one, what is it interesting for the care home to know about their own residents and how does that support care? But then there's also what is it interesting for social care and for the clinicians to know? And it's sort of uh, nourishing that conversation between this piece of work and those consumers and maybe also the traffic going the other way. So we're duplicating to a minimum, but starting to form a real uh, team around the individual um through through shared data so that, um, that's a big gangling question but um and, and, you know so are you asking if we're trying to do it in this study yeah or is that is that sort of 
part of your well, roadmap you're thinking about well, the, the digital social care record as i understand it is everything isn't it? it this is this is about agreeing everything that's collected about the resident that matters to their care is that yes. correct yeah so with the minimum data set what we're trying to say is what is the data that everybody would find i mean the clues in the word and and that's been quite a really difficult process so we're, so for example this minimum data i mean uh, jenny burton on this you know we're not collecting data for example on uh, whether somebody had a good night or so you know or yeah. that, that that kind of information which is really still important on the day-to-day -day, but in terms of isn't you know isn't 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 the deal breaker when you're trying you know that's where the outcome measures around quality of life if you're finding mm -hmm. your measures are go are saying it's a problem then you'd go back and look at the shared care record to say well what's happening does that make sense so that, that they're not either or and obviously we'll be taking data that would be in the in the shared care record um, i mean i'm interested in in and i i, I mean Anne Marie is probably are you still here Anne Marie is better qualified to talk about this you know is again about who gets to say what is in what gets extracted from the digital social the shared care record so what the minimum data set um is trying to say this is what everybody says they would want to know and should be there and that there is a difference there because and then of course it's we come on to trust and ownership and how that information gets used and I think one of the biggest challenges that we've seen historically is that people are really, really interested in aggregate data and making big statements that can or cannot, um, may or may not um, really reflect the particular situation of different uh, settings at different times. But Amory, I know you've got stuff on the, the shared care record as well. So do you want to speak a little bit to it? Yeah, no, I think I think that's a really good summary, Claire. I think, you know, it's it's about recognising the difference between the shared care record, which is for the purpose of delivering care and care notes and everything that goes with that versus the MDS. And, and delineating the two has been quite an exercise, I think, mm -hmm. in wrapping our heads around that. And so if you see the shared care records, which has got all of the health and social care data as being the baseline, that's something that's sitting there, and then the MDS being a smaller element of that that's extracted and linked. Um, I think that can be quite a helpful way of of, of differentiating between mm -hmm. the two. But the other layer of work that that we're interested in from a quality of life perspective is which picks up a little bit on the previous questions, which is there's one thing to capture and measure quality of life, but it is a different thing for that to then be used to inform direct care. And at the moment in Dutch, what we were doing was testing that feasibility, which is can we collect it? Can we measure it? Which measures seem to be working? Mm -hmm. And then there would need to be a separate bit of work, which would be around care planning and taking that, you know, collecting that data in these digital care records from a more shared care perspective, and then right how do we support the sector to then use this to inform direct care so our quality creating quality of life care plans for example and how that is balanced against the other kind of things that are, are embedded but that would have to be a bit of an extension to the work thank you feels like the work that you're doing is a really important building block mm -hmm. towards that that kind of future where we're sharing we're sharing what's really meaningful what's really valuable for to serve the different perspectives of the exactly. different professionals who are involved. So yeah, I, I'm really, I'm in awe of the work you're doing, fantastic. Thank you, it's quite, a, I think it's been quite a balancing act, hasn't it, to try and, and, and keep everybody's interests in mind and, and, and but also to really justify why this is needed when you know, bits of the data are more relevant for different parties. So yeah, quite tricky, thank you. Thank you. And can I just flag that we will be sharing the minimum data set as part of our final consultation. So um, and we will and there will be a survey and there are a focus group. I think we might like to come to you for one because we're organizing consultation groups by stakeholders. So it's like the care home staff, family and residents, commissioners, um, front level staff and so on. And we're asking people clinicians and we're asking people to re react to the minimum data set solely from their interest and then bringing it all together to then say okay this is where you have the consensus and this is where no we have complete different take on what you should or could be doing with the data so we'd love to follow up with you because of your work but I think we'd like to follow up with everybody and, and I just say you know I hope you're going to be okay if we invite you to take part in the consultation survey when we're sharing I think Giz will be doing that in January. January. Okay. Yes, the survey will start in January. 
yeah and, but, but we might we might chase some of you by your title to see if you'd like to be part of the um yeah. the discussion groups as well where you get to see them in minimum data set and have some of the further findings so thanks yeah and I would just say with the shared care record at the moment it feels like it's a health thing with a bit of social care stuff shoved in it and if we could get to a, a better balance that would be excellent I would say um, we've got some questions still and we've got one minute left. So I'm going to ask my colleagues if they'd be prepared to provide a bit of a written response to the remaining questions that we've not managed to answer. Would that be OK? So we've got a question from Neil. Um, we've got some uh, more questions from Sandra. So Giz, you've been collating them. Are you happy to take responsibility for responding to our, our gang? Because we've all got to go. Is that all right? Lovely. OK, well, thank you so much, everybody. Great to see you. Thank you for your interest. Spread the word. There are some more webinars over Thanks. the next few weeks and um, really appreciate your interest and your engagement. Fantastic questions. So thank you, everybody. And we'll see you in hmm, whenever the next one is. When's the next one, Giz? Uh, December, isn't it? It's December. Uh, the link is at the top of the links at the top. Um, yes, I can. One minute. I'll send it again. We'll see you in December and you'll have done all your Christmas shopping. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.